Good morning. Hello and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests. My name is Taylor Chazen and I am a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielina Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect for the rights and wisdom of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial history and commit to decolonizing our own practices, to learning new ways of being in community, in good relationship with the indigenous people of this land and with the land itself. Today's service is featuring our intern minister, Angeline Jackson, with Nicholas D'Augusto, Alyssa Lee, and Beth Holland, and music by Dr. Zaneda Robles and Wells Lang. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed and recorded on YouTube. Based on guidance from our COVID safety team, masks are recommended through, though optional for congregants inside and are optional outside. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary, the narthex, or in our new family lounge located in the living room of Neighborhood House where the service is live streamed on a big screen. The lounge is staffed by a host to help you feel at home. The governance and search committee discussion will be held today after service in the neighborhood house, and I was told there will be snacks. The Foster Kids Helping Hands, also known as ACAC, is holding its holiday drive right now. Help brighten the holidays for 45 local foster kids and youth. Drop by the table on the patio after the service or find the link to an online sign up in the newsletter. Our monthly board meeting will be held this Wednesday, November 30th at 6 p.m. in room 21 and on Zoom. Members and friends are welcome to observe. Please see the newsletter for the agenda and Zoom link. Also, Dining for Dollars is coming back, and Martin Matthews is here to tell us more about what's to come and how you can get involved. Good morning. Uh, my name is Martin Matthews, and I am your new Dining for Dollars Committee Chair for 2023. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, today, we're launching the annual Dining for Dollars campaign. On this Thanksgiving, I am particularly thankful for the wonderful community of friends that my family and I have enjoyed here at Neighborhood for almost 20 years. Why do I think that fundraising at Neighborhood is important? Well, I guess for me, I'm here for neighborhood because neighborhood's here for me, always giving me a place to share my stories, to learn about people, and to make the kinds of connections that week by week, month by month, turn the days of my life into an enriching and fulfilling story. I feel compelled to be here for neighborhood because it gives me so much. Giving something back to this place seems well right and good. If you're not aware of the program, here's a short primer on Dining for Dollars. Dining for Dollars is an annual fundraising campaign during which members offer up their services and expertise to support the church. These can be social events, dinner parties, family, children-centered events, almost anything you can think of, house concerts, a tour of somewhere special, a guided hike with some craft beer at the end of it. Maybe you can teach people a special skill or offer a professional service or consultation. You might have a vacation home to lend or season tickets to sports theater or the symphony to offer. In the Dining for Dollars world, the possibilities are endless and the proceeds all go to support neighborhood, a truly worthy cause. Some folks co-host events with friends to share the host expenses and we are always looking for new types of services and events and items that can be offered. After events and services are dreamt up by you, a catalog is posted online and printed near the end of January. The Dining for Dollars Committee will be setting up tables where you can bid certain amounts of money to attend a Dining for Dollars event. Some events are competitively bid upon. Some are more just like a flat fee. And for some events, the competition and the sign up for available spots can be fiercely and frankly pretty ununitarian. <laughs> If you are a veteran, Dining for Dollars donor, thank you for hosting. If you are a participant in the events, thank you for participating. If you've never hosted an event before, I invite you to dream up something that you feel excited about and go for it. The committee and I are here to help with suggestions and advice. Plan your event to take place sometime in 2023. I have some forms to hand out outside. 
and there are links and QR codes on the forums to help you submit your event online. The church website and the church newsletter are also easy places to find the Dining for Dollars links. The deadline for your listing this year is December 28th, so that's fairly soon. If you're not donating an event this year, I look forward to your support as a bidding participant in late January. Uh, once again, my name is Martin Matthews, and I'm here for Neighborhood because Neighborhood is always here for me. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Our order of service and more extensive announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email posted in the Narthex or through the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many other activities at the welcome table. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service. On the Brink by Reverend Leslie Takahashi from Voices from the Margins, an anthology of meditations. All that we have ever loved and all that we have ever been stands with us on the brink of all that we aspire to create. A deeper peace, a larger love, a more embracing hope, a greater generosity of spirit, a deeper joy in this life we share. We now invite folks that are watching from afar to light your chalices. Joining us in video will be our own Thomas and Ryan Holmes, 
And along with them will be some of the friendly faces of the prospective 2023 graduating class at Meadville Lombard Theological School. Rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing 226, People Look East. People look east, the time is near. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Hannah Peterson. I'm your religious education assistant. So today our story is Change Sings with words by Amanda Gorman and pictures by Loren Long. I can hear change humming in its loudest, proudest song. I don't fear change coming, and so I sing along. I scream with the skies of red and blue streamers. I dream with the cries of tried and true dreamers. I'm a chant that rises and rings. There is hope where my change sings. Though some don't understand it, those windmills of mystery, I sing with all the planet and its hills of history. I hum with a hundred hearts, each of us lifting a hand. I use my strength and my smarts, take a knee to make a stand. I'm bright as the light each day brings. There is love where my change sings. I show others tolerance, though it may take some courage. I don't make a, a taller fence, but fight to build a better bridge. I talk not only of distances from where and how we came. I also walk our differences to show we are the same. I'm a movement that roars and springs, 
There's a wave where my change sings. Change sings where? There, inside me, because I'm the change I want to see. As I grow, it grows like a seed. I am just what the world needs. I'm the voice where freedom rings. You're the love your bright heart brings. We are the waves starting to spring, for we are the change we sing. We're what the world is becoming, and we know it won't be long. We all hear change strumming. Won't you sing along? The end. Giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of contributions to a local social justice organization or activity. If you're visiting for the first or second time, welcome. You're our guest. Please let the plate pass you by. In addition to the plate, online giving is available using the QR code on the donations box just outside the sanctuary or using the text shown on the screen. If you're a member and wish to make a payment toward your pledge or are a non-pledging member and wish to make a gift, make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the donation box. All recipients are identified by church members. To recommend an organization, fill out the application in the social justice tab of the church website or ask a board member to connect you with the Share the Plate Committee. This week, our gifts go to the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. Here to tell us about UUSC is Lynn Miyamoto. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Lynn Miyamoto, and I'm actually a member of the board of directors of the UUSC. So a little bit about UUSC. We're a nonprofit, non-sectarian organization advancing human rights together with the international community of grassroots partners and advocates. We have three areas of strategic priorities, one being crisis response, like Ukraine, Haiti, Burma, climate justice, and the last is the Central American migrant justice. So one of the ways the US, UUSC engages congregation is through the Congregational Accompaniment Project for Asylum Seekers, COPPIS. And I think last week they played a video about COPPIS, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about the program and about a story involving one congregation. So what your support will do will help these congregations help asylum seekers go through the arduous process of going through being an asylee. So there was one congregation that helped an immigrant from Honduras named Roberto. And this is really an inspiring story because it involves our previous director of RE, the Reverend Sarah Lawal. It is her congregation in Boise that helped Roberto. So they went and traveled down, Sarah and four of her members from her church, down to the border to just see what the conditions were like. They decided that, yes, they wanted to help an asylee, and so they joined the CAPIS program. So they were connected Roberto. They posted bond for him. He got out. But by some error or mistake, ICE decided to take him back into custody. Okay? And this was an erroneous which is not surprising, I'm an immigration attorney, this happens often, that they took him back into custody and now they sent him to Tacoma, Washington. But Sarah and her congregation fought hard and got him released. They welcomed him into their community. They helped him through the process of going through an asylum hearing, which is very, very difficult and very emotional. They provide him with so many different supports in their community. However, when he was in custody, he also suffered an assault. And so they provided him sort of the trauma support after he got out. What is really exciting about this is that Roberto was the first asylee to get approved through the CAPAS program. And so I hope you will you know, support this program. I hope one day that our congregation can also support perhaps an asylee through this program. Um, if you want to know more about 
this story and Sarah's um, participation in this story. It is on the UUSC website. So please give as generously as you can and know that all of the partners that we help, particularly in this program, the congregations that we help, really make a difference in Asylee's life. Thank you so much. Will the ushers please come forward?
Hi, everyone. My name is Nicholas D'Augusto. I'm a seminarian um, student alongside Angeline. So that's why she's asked me to be a part of the service today. A <clears throat> reading is Abundance of Faith by Howard Thurman from Meditations of the Heart. And some of the words have been modified to be inclusive. I have faith. Help thou my lack. I have faith. I live by my faith even as all people do. Faith in this day that it will blend into tomorrow. Faith in my mind that understandings may re be reliable. Faith in my heart that feelings may be trustworthy. Faith in my friends that we may enjoy one another's hours. Faith in the world that I may not fail it. Faith in life that all my ventures may be bottomed. Faith in God, that my hope may not perish. I have faith. I have faith, help thou my lack. My faith in this day makes clear my lack of it. Faith in my own mind delivers me to error. Faith in my own heart reveals my blindness. Faith in my friends reveals my unworthiness. Faith in the world points up my own failures. Faith in God defines me as a sinner. I have faith, help thou my lack of it. Because no one can desire what they do not already possess, and no one can want what they are not already sharing. I seek with all my heart an abundance of faith that my lack may be redeemed and my faith may be full.
Good morning, neighborhood. Unitarians and Universalists rejected various aspects of Christianity that defined what Christianity meant in the 16th and 17th century American East. However, despite their bold declarations of non-Trinitarianism for the Unitarians and universal salvation for Universalists, both traditions hesitated to disrupt the image of pastoral ministry as a man's world. Now, that's not to say women didn't serve as ministers, but between these two denominations, Universalist women led the way for women in ministry, and they could be found in Unitarian churches. Despite this, by 1890, only around 70 women were ordained across the Unitarian and Universalist churches. These women had numerous challenges. They were marginalized by their denominations. They were sent to barely existing parishes, and they had to struggle to find full-time ministry. Yet they persisted. Something drove these women. And I think hope was one of those things. Hope that one day things would change, that they would be treated better by the denomination, not just society at large, and that the women who came after them would have better opportunities and experiences. 152, 132 years later, I am able to sit with two of my awesome seminary colleagues and women. Alyssa Lee is the intern at First Parish in Wayland, Massachusetts, and Beth Monholland is the intern at Wellsprings Congregation in Pennsylvania. Alyssa and Beth, thank you both for taking a slice of your time to have this chat with me and with Neighborhood. The early women of our faith were courageous. They were brave. Given the state of our world today, the phobias, the violent incendiary rhetoric, the climate disasters, and the general just upside down state of things. I, I wonder what lessons we could glean from these early women about hope and change. Beth, I believe your final paper for our history class is about one of these early women of her faith. Could you tell us more about her um, or the, the other women in, in the early women in our faith and what lessons we could learn from her? I'm writing a paper on Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, uh, who is amazing. And I use the term in the present tense on purpose because there is still so much from her that we can learn. She was a prolific poet, essayist, novelist, speaker, abolitionist, suffragist, and African-American leader. So she was actually one of the early African-American, well, not early, we're talking 18, from, she was active as an a activist from the 1840s to, to her death in 1911. But she was one of the early in the, what has become, what became the modern Unitarian Church African-American leaders. She was a founder of uh, one of the churches here I, I live near Philadelphia. So her, she embodied before this term ever got coined intersectionality in a really vivid and, and amazing way. And so I'm writing a paper and I'm focusing on her poetry um, and how her poetry reveals both her political and her religious views. And she was also, I'll say this, while well, she was a Unitarian um, and her funeral happened at the First Unitarian Church in Philadelphia, she also remained an active member in the AME Church for her, for her entire adult life as well. She had dual membership in both and was very active in both. And, and her lessons to me are about the ways in which, and by the way, she was not a minister per se, but she was an active lay leader in various congregations and in political and social movements. And so I think, I think when I think about our modern day Unitarian Universalist movement and the ways in which we are 
really trying to live into shared ministries. She is a shining example of someone who did not seek formal ordination, but had a ministry in serving her community that really served the, those who had positional authority as ministers. And I think that's the biggest lesson I take from her is how do you work with people across difference? Um, and how do you work from a position where you are perceived in multiple ways um, and not just perceived, but actually placed on the margins in multiple ways and build coalitions and build relationships in order to have shared values and a shared vision um, and, and to really be vocal about what is right and what is wrong within, within traditions that you love. So she was critical of Christianity. She was critical of the misogyny inherent in Christian churches. She was critical of the ways in which scripture was interpreted in misogynistic ways to, to keep women oppressed and the ways in which it was uh, Christianity was used in racialized ways to keep black people oppressed. And I love her example of someone being critical of the tradition which she loved, not as a way of tearing it down, but as a way of demanding that it become its aspirational best self. And that's really, I think, in her work in the AME church and in the Unitarian church, what she was demanding and what she was embodying and modeling. So she's amazing. You should all go read her work. But Alyssa, I see you're on mute. <laughs> I um yeah I was I was really inspired so we we read for our history class we read a um book called Prophetic Sisterhood um which I would also recommend and uh it, it largely featured white women oh there you go um <laughs> and it was uh women who were um sort of on the on the frontier at the time which is like had gone west which is was like Iowa Wisconsin um Illinois. Illinois. Okay. Yes. Um, parts of the country that I'm not familiar with, uh, but it's all the same. Um, and, you know, they were very inspirational and they were also many of them where um, they were not given admission to seminary. Some of them were, you know, but many of them, you know, sort of worked their way up and, and took a lot of these roles that um, men just, just weren't able to take, you know, they, they send these, these men, these male ministers from the east um and they would send them to this this part of the country and you know the thing is a lot of them just sort of expect to be to do the sermon and be done with it um but that wasn't enough at that time and so um they often didn't really last and it was the women who were there who were sort of i think more aligned with what we would consider to be ministers now like they were more you know they did the pastoral care um took care of the building even, you know, uh, supervised the staff if there were any, um, and did the sermons. Um, and they, they were very prevalent during that time to the level that um, there was, you know, recounts of, of children saying, if like a man came to visit, they were like, what's this man doing in the pulpit? Like to so many of the children in the area, they knew women to be the ministers, which is, um, again, a history that I had not ever heard before, um, mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting. Um, I think one of the things that I really learned from, from their lesson is really about, um, how much they, they were so collaborative with each other. Um, you know, there's really, they, they shared, you know, pulpits together. They, um, often, you know, traveled around, um, and, uh, you know, and many of them had to, they sort of moved, moved all over, um, but what I love is it really was like a sisterhood in a lot of ways. Like they really supported each other, um, particularly in ministry, um, because it was a, it was a difficult life and they had to make a lot of sacrifices. And so they were really there. Many of them were really there for each other, and they sort of knew their own strengths and weaknesses. And there's there's two women in particular, um, Mary Safford and um, Eleanor Gordon, who started out ministry together. Um, eventually, they they split up, but um, you know, they sort of both, um, knew what their, their strengths were and worked accordingly. Eleanor primarily was also a teacher as well, but she really contributed to Mary's, um, ministry as well. So, um, 
I, I love that idea, you know, certainly as seminarians, I think we all work very collaboratively together um, and really help each other out. And so it's it's been really uh, edifying to see that that sort of where that's, you know, that germ of that experience and and hopefully um, I hope to do that into my own ministry as I hopefully get, get ordained at some point. I'm glad you lifted that up, Alyssa, about the collaboration with colleagues and how critical it is. Because even when I think of shared ministry within a congregation, you know, I think of everybody knowing that we're here to serve each other. And yes, there's going to be people on a staff and even, you know, a, a minister or ministers um, who are all working together for the spiritual care of a community, right? But also then across across a faith movement, which Unitarian Universalism certainly is, how do we be, how do we share in the ministry of our faith movement together? And I think, when I think about hope, the beginning, your beginning question, Angeline, and I think about our history, and I think about these, these incredible humans who were literally on frontiers, literally geographically on frontiers, um, or metaphorically on frontiers, the way certainly the African-American men and women uh, faith leaders were. Um, I think about how important it was that they stayed connected to each other. Not that they agreed with each other, right? They didn't have to agree. They didn't have to agree on the methods. They didn't have to agree on a, a position, but they had to have some shared values and, and, to, and to have a space, a space where they could we, we talked about this once in a class recently where they could be accountable for what wasn't yet here. And that's where the hope is that, that what they, what the women early in our traditions, both Unitarians and Universalists, whether they were formal ministers or doing ministries in a variety of ways, that they were creating a world that didn't exist. Like they were literally being accountable for what they envisioned together. And that collegiality of saying, we can dream this together because we, we are centering love and that's so much of what their work was. How do we love the people we are serving and how do we love them enough to say the world as it is, is not okay. And we're going to make the world different. And we might fail at it, but we're going to keep, we're going to keep working to make it different. And um, I know I've held you for a little bit longer than 15 minutes is there anything you want to say as final words before I wrap us up in a bow tie? Okay. Um, so my colleagues mentioned um, the experience, the, 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 the reality, the history of women kind of almost the system trying to remove them from, from, from record. And so, I wanted to start back from that point and just wrap us up. When the women began to get pushed out of their ministries in, in all the ways, some found ways to stay and fight. Others found new ways to give life to their ministerial calling, new life. And as their lives drew to a, to a close, many realized that the change they had hoped for would not happen in their lifetime but they continued to fight with the denomination. I, I tell you, 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 read that book. You will see the fights that they had. It may be said that they lost hope, but they were not hopeless. And sometimes I feel the same way about our world. I've, as I mentioned earlier, I've lost hope in the sense that I've misplaced it, but I'm not entirely without it. Somehow, somewhere, for whatever reason, Hope remains, if not in the present, then in generations to come. Hope that one day we can rise above our divisions and partisanship. We can rid the world of the vile rhetoric that causes hate crimes and violence. And we can hope, we hope that our world will change one day. Hope that we will consistently recognize the inherent worth and dignity of each person Hope that we will consistently recognize and respect the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. And hope that love will remain at the center of how we move through the world. 
Alyssa and Beth, thank you so very much for joining us, joining Neighborhood, joining me this morning, um, this evening as we are recording and this morning when we stream. Um, thank you both so much. Um, it was wonderful to have you here today. The link to the full recording of this chat will be in this week's newsletter. Our closing hymn is number 346 in your gray hymnal or on the screens above. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing, Come Sing a Song With Me. benediction words for our benediction comes from Reverend Joseph M. Cherry prayer for living intention and can be found in voices from the margins an anthology of meditations if we have hope of transforming the world and changing ourselves, we must be bold enough to step into our discomfort, brave enough to be clumsy there, loving enough to forgive ourselves and others. May we, as a people of faith, be granted the strength to be so bold, so brave, and so loving.